Welcome to the sixth talk of Human Factors in Design. My name is Joseph Jackerman, and today we'll be discussing the very, very important sensory modality of human vision. So, first of all, a few background uh, comments on what we're talking about, what we're referring to when we say people can see and have a vision system to perceive the world through light. First of all, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. It's one of several. It just happens to be the one we've evolved to, to use the most, to be most useful to us, because there is a sun at a certain distance from the Earth whose temperature in Kelvin produces a large amount of radiation in this frequency band. So there's many types of radiation. Theoretically, over millions of years, creatures could have evolved different systems of sensing, and, and other creatures have other sensory capabilities, perhaps beyond vision. Vision is what we rely on the most. It's about 75 to 80% of the kind of processing, sensory processing we do in the brain. And it's because there's a sun that produces lots of it and sends it to us. So, looking at the visible spectrum, what we see with our eyes, uh, you can notice very quickly that it's only a tiny little part or a tiny slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're talking about electromagnetic radiation roughly in the frequency region from about 400 nanometers to about, let's say, 750, 800, 900 nanometers. If you look at the other frequencies on the spectrum, you have your gamma rays, your X-rays, your radar, your television, electricity. There's lots of other things happening. Now, today we will be focusing on vision, because again, that's about 70, 80, 85 percent in many occasions of the information we use to perceive things, think about things, do things. However, it's important to realize that as designers, uh, you may be designing systems which produce radiation also in these other regions, and many of these radiations cannot be perceived by people. So there's concepts like electrosmog, electrical devices producing electrical magnetic fields with certain frequencies. We have no natural ability or receptors as part of our body to perceive these, but some have been shown, at least at very high doses, to uh, create uh, physical or mental problems to, to possibly make people ill. So as designers, it's important to consider a lot of what we do is about vision, light, and seeing things. However, we also design things which could affect people in other ways, and they have no way of knowing it. So the eye. Most people have two of them. You can check yours very quickly. 20 to 25 centimeter, uh, millimeters in diameter is the size. The eye has a whole set of structures to it. The eye is actually flexible. We don't stop to think of that very often, but things like motorcycle helmets, race car helmets, scooter helmets, bicycle helmets, many different types of helmets are designed to try to protect the eye from the motion it gets during an impact when your head uh, touches something. So the fact that it's full of fluid, it's flexible, is a very important characteristic. It needs to be designed for and protected for. What's happening is the outer membrane of the eye, which keeps it together, the tough, elastic membrane, is called the sclera. The sclera is, think of it as a balloon membrane inside most of the mass and structure of the eye is actually liquid, which renders it rather changeable and flexible, and it can move quite a bit as we bounce around on our bicycle or our automobile. Behind the eye, uh, behind, in the eye, the first uh, optic region, the first one we think about as having an optic property, is called the cornea. 
it's that little fixed lens which is at the top of this diagram it's the little bulbous protrusion from the circular shape of the eye the cornea provides a fixed transparent lens it's the first of the two optical lenses of the eye after uh, the cornea there's aqueous humor you can see it marked on the top of the diagram on the right. Aqueous humor is a transparent fluid uh, similar to saline solution. Uh, aqueous humor and vitreous humor, the one that's below the lens on the other side of the cavity, they are uh, liquids which are relatively transparent but not perfectly transparent, which is why occasionally if you close your eyes, you might see little dots moving around. And more occasionally, even when you're looking at something for a fixed period of time, you may notice small dots which appear to be moving. These are the residues of white blood cells that fought an infection. They are residues of things occurring metabolically in us, which are in the vitreous or the aqueous humor and uh, they uh, because it's not absolutely perfectly transparent so occasionally we will see a little bit of something in our view field and that's because of what's in these fluids now below the cornea we then reach the iris which is that colored membrane that we see uh, in people's eyes when we say someone has brown eyes blue eyes uh, green eyes and so forth that's the color of the pigmentation of the iris we're actually seeing and at the center of the iris there is the very important uh, optical controller which is the pupil the pupil which is a small aperture which can change its diameter anywhere in the range typically for the average person from two to eight millimeters those of you who do a lot of photography, have a passion for photography, will be familiar with the effects of setting the aperture on the camera. The aperture being the opening that when you release the shutter opens up and lets the light in. This is exactly biologically the same thing. Cameras are mimicking very much what happens in biological systems. Now, Optically, we have a fixed lens at the cornea, and then we have an adjustable lens just below the iris and the pupil. And the reason we have to have an adjustable lens, just like the reason you have to have adjustments to the focal length on the second lens of your camera as well, is because we would like to look very much at things sometimes nearby and sometimes far away where far away or far field condition is normally defined as approximately five meters. So if we're reading our newspaper or working on our laptop, we're a 20, 30, 40 centimeter distance. That would be near field or near conditions. If we're looking at something in the park or in the parking lot and it's quite a distance away, that's clearly going to be far field or far conditions. Given we need to look at both, and given that two fixed lens, if that was the case for the eye, would not permit us to get things in focus when we're looking close and refocus on things and get a clear picture when we're looking far away, the lens has to change its shape. Now, when the lens is relaxed, when you're sleeping, for example, at night with your eyes closed, when the lens is relaxed, it tends to be relatively flat, which is what you're seeing towards the bottom of this image. In that configuration, you can focus, you can see relatively well, get all the details without too much fuzziness on things far away, things beyond five, six, seven meters in distance. Instead, if we want to sit here and look at our laptops or our cell phones all day, as unfortunately most of us are doing these days, we then have to have our eyes pull by means of a small set of muscles which are around the lens and attached to the lens in various points. It pulls and it pushes the lens into a rounded position, a more circular type shape, a more oval type shape. And this shape then permits us 
to get the image onto the retina at the back of the eye in one place all together clearly and gives us the ability to focus. So there is a process called accommodation. Why are we talking about these things in the human factors course? Because we're not optometrists and we're not necessarily doctors worried about eye conditions, but this is incredibly important from a human factors and ergonomics point of view. And the reason being the ability of people to focus over time, statistically, okay, because some people might be better, some people a little bit less, a little bit more, people vary a little, but statistically, across the population, in general, as a generalization. The ability to focus changes dramatically from when you're a teenager to when you're an elderly individual. From 16 years of age onward, and unfortunately probably most of the people listening to this discussion today are already beyond 16 years of age. From 16 years onward, the ability to change the shape of the lens, to focus on things, changes. And it gets less and less and less due to the lens becoming more rigid, the muscles that control it becoming slightly weaker as fibers are lost, and also a little bit the neurological processes of the control system getting slightly noisier, the neurons and the, the electronics, as it were, controlling the movement of the muscles loses some of its ability. And in practical terms, people who work in the field of human factors and ergonomics are very concerned about the fact that what's referred to as the 10 centimeter near point changes quite dramatically from teenage to the elderly. When you're 16, the near point being the point at which I can take a sheet of paper and bring it close to me and be able to read and see everything in focus clearly. If I keep going, it starts to blur. The point at which the blurring begins is referred to optically as the near point. The near point for a 16 year old is about 10 centimeters from the eye, so it's very close to the face. The near point for a person 60 years of age is about 100 centimeters. That's one meter. That's when your grandma or granddad is reading the newspaper like this with the newspaper, their arms out, and the paper so far away from their body. If you've ever seen that sort of behavior and wondered why, it's because that's the closest the person can bring the thing to their face without the text and the fonts on the page beginning to blur. So this change in near point is important because as a designer, as a human factors expert, where do you put the information? How far away is the screen on the machine? Um, in the car, how big does the font have to be on the dashboard considering the ability of the driver to accommodate? So accommodation is a very important thing that needs to be considered, highly age dependent. Another thing that's age-dependent and uh, frequently even more problematic for human factors people than the accommodation is the question of the degradation or change of the lens itself. The human lens is never perfectly transparent. Nothing is perfect in this world. So the lens is always slightly yellowish. It, it's always somehow not perfectly transmitting light through to the back of the eye where the retina is and the receptors are, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the problem is that the brain can compensate for that. But as we get older and the ability to refresh and rebuild materials in our body due to changes in genetics and aging and so forth, uh, the lens gets more and more dark. It gets less and less optically transparent as the years go by. Now the three images on this particular slide are three images which have been um, selected. I think it was a re research team at the University of San Francisco in the United States. The idea was to try to help people to understand the actual practical effects 
of aging on the lens. What we have to the left of the slide is what a person should be seeing perhaps as a teenager so forth when the lens is relatively clear. In the middle is what the picture, if we push light through the yellowed elderly lens, the middle picture is what we would see projected on the wall. If we put a projector with the image and we put um, the lens in between and then we see what gets projected on the wall, the middle image is what someone would see with if their lens was 60 years of age and the image on the right is what somebody will be seeing at 75 years of age. And what you can notice is that as the years go by, uh, the amount of light getting through the lens is greatly reduced, and the colors uh, blend, get blended out, and it gets more yellow and more brown as the time passes. Now, looking at the image on the far right, which is a little bit catastrophic, you may be wondering, well, if somebody is only getting so little light through their lens reaching the retina at the back of the eye at that age, how can they possibly see anything or make out any colors? The answer is that the human mind, the brain, the nervous system, the sensory capabilities, the visual cortex areas one, two, and three at the back of the head are compensating which is why lots of mistakes occur. A lot of the times we are estimating, particularly when we're elderly, we're estimating things like colors because our bodies are not really presenting it to us as well as it did when we were younger. And a lot of it's guesswork, which is why we have a lot of arguments. If you've ever seen two individuals arguing about, oh, that car is dark green, oh no, the car is light brown, and they're sitting there in the parking lot arguing over the color of something, this is usually the issue. If they're elderly, it's quite likely probably to be the issue. If they're younger, it could still be the issue because people do have substantial differences in color perception. When we all say red, it doesn't mean we're all seeing and imagining exactly the same thing. It's a subjective property. So what's going on at the back of the eye to capture this radiation and convert it into what in our minds is our subjective experience of vision. Up to now we talked about lenses and pupils and optical properties similar to the camera. We didn't say anything about the camera film or the chemicals as it were to convert things into from different frequencies into something that we would recognize as color. Well, at the back of the eye there's an area called the retina retina from the word in Latin for net, and the reason we call it net is already from antiquity. People had looked into people's eyes uh, with lenses and seen that the back of the eye, there's lots of blood vessels, because this is a very energy intensive business of converting frequencies of radiation into electrical signals to send to the brain. So there's lots of blood vessels to provide nutrients to these particular cells, and seeing all of these blood vessels, they called it the net because there's lots and lots of them arranged in a pattern. Now, what those blood vessels, the thing we, the only thing really we can see from the outside, what they're actually there to do is provide the blood supply and the nutrients to these particular cells, the rods and the cones, and not too much imagination in the names, just look at the sketch. The sketch is actually a sketch which captures to a certain degree what it actually looks like under a microscope when you blow it up enough to see these tiny little uh, sensors or receptors in the back of the eye in the retina region. The rods are the ones that are longer and more cylindrical. You can see quite a few of them at the top. And the cones, just as the name suggests, are slightly more cone-shaped or conical in nature tend to be a little bit flatter. The two types of receptors you see in the drawing, there's lots of little stripes going across. The stripes are just layers, like a layered cake. They're just layers of pigments and chemicals which capture the photons from the light 
of the frequency they capture. Each one has certain frequency characteristics and it captures the photons. Little chemical reaction makes a bit of electrochemical electricity which runs down the bottom of the cell, runs to the ganglia where they're collected and all that electricity goes up eventually to the visual cortex of the brain. So there's about 120 million rods there's about as much less 10 million cones as we'll see in a minute the rods there's a lot of them around the bottom of the eye the cones are all grouped in one little area called the fovea which does a very special job which we'll talk about in a second so what do we what does it look like on the inside of the eye how do we talk about things first of all we, to talk about what's happening inside the eye, uh, most scientists, optometrists, doctors, and so forth will refer to the optic axis. The optic axis is a straight line which runs from outside the front of the eye, through the cornea, through the lens, and straight to a little small indentation in the back of the eye, in the retina region, a small indentation referred to as the fovea. You can see at the bottom of the diagram. The fovea is where all the cones are located and we'll talk in a minute what they do. They do color perception and we'll talk about that in a second. Around the edges what you can see as the degrees measured from the optic axis around the edges 20 degrees 40 degrees 60 80 and so forth that's populated mostly almost completely uh, totally by rods and as we'll see in a moment the rods are what capture black white gray vision rods are specialized in motion detection they respond to things that change in intensity something moving about in our view field gets picked up by the rods they're all around the edges and that's what gives us peripheral vision the fovea is when we're looking at something a magazine and we see a nice picture we see lots of colors and smiling faces and details the fovea is what gives us the details and the color resolution and it only works when we're pointing straight at the thing we're looking at another uh, structure of importance in optometry is what's referred to as the optic nerve which is down at the bottom of this image the optic nerve is important to consider from a human factors ergonomics point of view because the optic nerve is the place where all of these signals from all of these 120 million rods and 10 million cones and all these electrical signals coming from these they're actually neurons they're specialized sensory neurons the optic nerve is where all the lines get collected get passed through the schlera and move towards the brain somehow you got to get these signals out of your eye and into your brain visual cortex for processing so somewhere physically, just like electric lines being passed through the wall of a building, somewhere you have to run them and pass them through the membrane. The optic nerve is where that happens, and on its own it wouldn't be interesting, but what's interesting from a human factor's point of view is you don't see anything there. You can't possibly have any receptors in that little millimeter wide area because that's where all the other receptors are passing their electric si electrical signals through. That means, even though you don't notice it most of the time, there's a little blind spot or a dark spot in your view field that's always there. Why don't you notice it? Again, because the brain is filling in the gaps, the, the brain is estimating and guessing the best it can to make your life simple by smoothing everything out stabilizing everything and making things simpler but the fact is that's an estimate that's a uh, calculation that's taking the average and averaging across an area if you as a designer put something right in that place there on the dashboard in the car and the person's when they're looking forward that's always in the blind spot no surprise the person often doesn't notice 
the reading that's being provided. And you'd be surprised how many accidents with aircraft and vehicles do occur for reasons like this. Okay, looking at the rods and the cones, their distribution around the eye is what's being shown in this diagram here. You can see, as I've already indicated, that the vast majority, almost all of the cones are in the fovea, that very small area at zero on the optic axis. The rods are spread a little bit more evenly around the periphery. As I said, cones are your detailed color and precision vision, and the rods, as I said previously, are more your peripheric capture the fact that someone's moving up behind you to jump you. you. You get the feeling there was some movement, you're not sure what it was. It's your peripheric motion sensing uh, vision. And as we said, there is a blind spot and uh, here it looks like in this case it's about five to seven degrees of optic uh, vision field. That area there on uh, your, the back of your eye, there is no ability to sense light. So whatever you see in your vision when you're looking forward at things and you don't see a black hole in the middle of your view field, that is an average, smoothed, estimated, calculated, simulated event which is trying to fill in the gap. But whatever you see there is not necessarily really there. Now one little comment, not too huge an issue, but it's worth mentioning about human vision. I think it's worth commenting on the range of intensities of light that our poor eyes are capable of dealing with. So if we're sitting in a lecture theater, in a, in a coffee shop, if we're sitting in a room in an office somewhere, and we have only very small amount of lights, illumination in the room, we might get up go walk out the door, maybe to walk to the coffee shop and get a coffee, and outside it might be a bright sunny day, and there may be no clouds in the sky, and it might be around lunchtime, middle of the day. We may quickly jump three, four, five orders of magnitude or more in the intensity of the light as would be measured by a light meter. Those of you who do photography, you probably have a light meter that you use to check the readings on the light and make adjustments on your apertures and on your exposure settings for your films. Well, it's not unusual to have five, six orders, orders of magnitude, adding five or six zeros to the number. Well, here is a little diagram which shows uh, roughly the limits of human vision, where the minimum threshold of vision is given at the bottom at 10 to the minus six, and at the top we have, oh, I'm in the headlights of a car with all its light beams on, I'm being blinded, I can't see anything, it's just painful, I can't see, I can only feel a bit of pain as my eyes suffer this uh, intensity. That's about 10 to the fourth. Don't worry too much about the units, there's several different units that can be used for light intensity, we're not going to go into that, it's easy to get confused, but it's not important. The important is whatever units you're using, that's about 10 orders of magnitude. That's 10 zeros after the one. So your eyes are capable of seeing things from something so tiny to something enormous that varies with 10 zeros after the, uh, the number. The reason we cite this is because as designers, first of all, we shouldn't abuse the privilege that we have a vision system this capable, this nonlinear, this able to adjust the size of the pupil, the sensitivity of the chemicals on the rods and the cones and so forth. So first of all, we need to use reasonable values for illumination in our design projects because we don't want to abuse it. But then it's also important to consider whether on occasion we're putting people in conditions near the limits of that. Uh, it doesn't take much in the evening to get near the perception threshold for light, and it certainly doesn't take uh, too much um, illumination to blind us with too strong a lighting. So it's important to try to stabilize the situation, not abuse it, and, ch and be careful where we are with respect to these light intensity values. 
Now, in terms of how the eye adjusts to work over 10 orders of magnitude in a halfway decent manner, we talk about different lighting conditions and we talk, particularly doctors will talk about what's changing and what's happening in each condition to make this possible to work over such a wide range. The illuminance conditions that we tend to refer to, we tend to break up that uh, 10 order of magnitude range into roughly three uh, levels. We talk about photopic, mesotopic, and we talk about scotopic conditions. At illuminance values above 0 0.1 lux, and again, don't worry about the units, there's, there's several different types of units in common usage in different industries. The point is just whenever you're doing something, you need to be consistent which ones you're using. But the unit itself is not the point. The point is the relative behaviors in the different uh, levels. B above 0 0.1 lux, that's what most people would think of as a reasonable day, reasonably sunny, when you see the colors of everything really well and everything, the details can be seen clearly. 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, this is the middle region. There's always a middle. In life, there's always something tiny, something really big, and then most of what's going on tends to be in the middle. Well, the middle is called the mesotopic region, and when we get to zero, one, or below, we're actually talking about scotopic vision. That's when you're late in the evening and it's just going dark, or you're out in the, at night with a, a moon, a full moon or a half moon out, so it's not completely pitch black, you can see something. Now, this picture that I chose to put on this particular slide is useful because in the picture, you can see examples of what the human eye also tends to provide you in terms of subjective perception in each of the three uh, intensity ranges. There's a sun in this picture. It looks like uh, probably uh, early evening when the sun's going down at the beach perhaps you see a sun and the sun is incredibly bright so it's definitely a photopic uh, situation of vision so the sun you can see an edge to it you can see colors you can see white bright in the middle bit yellow turning into orange brown so you can make out lots of detail and clearly even small differences in color that's what you see during the day, bright conditions photopic. At the bottom of the image, instead, there is a rather dark gray-black region where you can sort of see the edges of these blades of grass. Maybe there's some sand or something at the beach. Maybe it's a sand dune. You can sort of make out something, but it's not terribly clear. And that's what you get with scotopic vision. You get your black, white, and gray, you get your peripheral vision, but even looking at it straight on, using your fovea and using your uh, cones to try to get all the detail possible, all the color possible, you're getting no color and very little detail. And in the middle, there's this area where you can see the blades of grass somewhere between the sun and the lower uh, regions, which are mostly black and gray and you can sort of see a bit more detail and a little bit of color and sort of in between. So this is the subjective scenario you've got. Again, why are we doing this? We're not doctors. We're talking about it because it's human-centered or human factors or ergonomic designers. We have to make some important decisions about the colors, the font sizes, the intensities, and how they will be different or the same during the day or in the evening. Driving a car, flying an airplane in the middle of the night when everything outside is dark, if you don't compensate the light intensity and maybe the color layout and maybe occasionally even the fonts and the graphics, if you don't compensate for the fact that most of what you're doing is probably using the rods at that low level of intensities rather than the cones, 
you would end up that you may have errors, which could lead to accidents and, and all kinds of problems. So as designers, we have big responsibilities to consider the scenarios in which things are used, what are the two illumination levels involved, what's the importance of picking up color and or detail in that particular scenario to do that particular thing, and then design appropriately. Now, is human vision a sort of intensity is the only thing important and it's always the same kind of situation or is human vision something that's also time dependent well everything in this universe does tend to be time dependent so when we change the illumination level across several orders of magnitude going from light to the dark are going from the dark to the light, it takes a little while for our eye to adjust. We have to adjust the size of the pupil, we have to pull the lens, we have to change the sensitivities of the chemicals in the rods or the cones or both. We have at the level of the neural cortex to make some adjustments, kick in different filters, different uh, processing abilities. To get the most out of things, it takes a while to get everything, perf all the settings, if you wish to think of it that way, get them all to their optimum. So when we're going into a tunnel, we have the problem of vision adaptation from light to dark. This is a situation which keeps designers rather busy because there's lots of tunnels on the motorways, there's lots of tunnels on the railways, there's tunnels everywhere, there's buildings with dark corridors and so forth and so on. So it's important designers be aware that the adaptation that happens when you go from very strong light to somewhat darker, several orders of magnitude darker, it takes a while to adjust. Full compensation, full adjustment of all the settings to get the most out of your vision system will take something of the order of 20 to 30 minutes. The Compensation or the adaptation is in both the rods and the cone systems independently and the characteristic response if you measure in the lab how quickly people are adapting and plot the, the, the minimum intensity threshold of light they can see as a function of time, you see that the characteristic curve is actually made up of the two independently. The cones have their adjustment and the rods have their adjustment and what we can see and what we say if we're put to the test is the result of the two added together and uh, the rods of course are the ones that seem to take much longer and they require somewhere the order 20-30 minutes so the average motorway tunnel or the average railway tunnel there's absolutely no hope because very few are long, so long it takes 20 to 30 minutes to transverse them, there's no hope of complete adaptation without some tricks. So when you go into a motorway tunnel, there's not too many in the United Kingdom, but if you drive in Italy or Switzerland or France or Germany or Austria, where we have tunnels all over the place all the time of all lengths, you will notice that the illumination systems in the tunnels will change their intensity as you go in and some of the more modern ones may change the color of the light as well. The various changes that you're seeing are things that designers specified to try to assist this process and follow this process to try to make the best compromise to use to the best of the abilities the person's response. So rather than just take you from bright sunlight into a fixed level of darkness, they tend to modulate you and get you in there slowly to give your curve a chance to go the way it wants to go in the most efficient manner possible. So do take a look on the continent sometimes at some of the longer tunnels and you'll see quite interesting tricks in place to try to assist this process. Now coming out of the tunnel, the other way around is a little bit easier for designers because adaptation from light to dark can take as much as 30 minutes to be complete, perfect, everything at its best. Instead from dark to light, usually a matter of a few minutes, two, three, four minutes. So coming out of the tunnel is a lot easier as a design challenge from going in 
which is why quite often you see less sophisticated lighting at the exit uh, of a tunnel if it's only one direction of travel. Um, the adaptation coming out just as it was going in is different for the rods and the cones, uh, but it's not too big a problem in most cases in either, either way. Now, other things we need to talk about with vision, which are important for human factors, visual acuity. Visual acuity is defined as the ability of the creature, in our case humans, to make out small differences in things like fonts, symbols, mathematical symbols, pictures, things with complicated details. How much detail, how small can be a difference in angle or size in a drawing and you still be able to see it clearly without it having been blurred out and fuzzy. Well, visual acuity, um, usually in terms of optometry, is measured in terms of the minimum visual angle that you can make out and not be guessing. So if someone shows you something and says, is it there, isn't there, is it pointing to the right or pointing to the left, it's the minimum visual angle of the eye covering that size, which you can still, if asked the question and you're tested, you can answer the question correctly. And if you do tests with people and you go and measure what is this minimum visual angle a person can make out and understand in their view field, you get quite a surprising, uh, quite a, an impressive result. A normal observer can resolve details of one minute of art. One minute of arc for most people doesn't mean much because you might not be using degrees in arcs very often in your work. However, just to put it in practical terms, that's roughly the size of a United States 25 cent coin, which is just, just slightly bigger than a 20p coin of the type we use here in the UK. It's that size at a distance of 80 meters. So it's that size. So your mate picks up a 20p coin, starts from the goal post, and walks all the way across the football pitch to the other side of the football pitch, holds it up, the coin, and says, can you see it? And you probably will be able to see it at 80, maybe even 100 meters distance. That's the impressive visual acuity of the human eye. And this is the reason why in industry we spend such vast sums of money to get the alignment of things correct and to get the assembly precision of things correct. If you put up a bookshelf on your wall and you don't measure it perfectly and you don't measure the distance from the floor too carefully, the first friend that comes through the door will say, why is your bookshelf crooked? And that's because a person can see this tiny little difference from one end of the bookshelf to the other going across the room. In the parking lot back here, there's various automobiles that cost 30, 40, 50, 80,000 pounds. A large part of that cost is high quality satisfying materials, often in the interior, but another large part of that cost is assembly operations which can get fender panels, roof panel, bonnets, grills, lights and so forth aligned to within fractions of a millimeter. If someone buys a 50,000 pound car and then looks from across the bonnet from the front towards the windscreen and sees the crack of the bonnet on each side changing by even a couple tenths of a millimeter from the start at the nose of the car to the base of the windscreen, the person will probably take the car back to the dealership and complain that something wrong, the fender is crooked. That is the kind of scenario which manifests itself all of the time with consumer products particularly and it's because of this. If you couldn't see this level of detail, you wouldn't be forcing car companies, forcing consumer goods, forcing Apple and Samsung to produce uh, 
artifacts whose assembly precision is at this level of detail and this close together the panel runs and the joints and the motions when we open and close lids and so forth we would not demand this level of precision if we couldn't see it and this is the reason we can uh, we can demand it so visual acuity as uh, with the distribution of the receptors themselves if you plot a diagram where the x-axis is the optic axis and the y-axis is the acuity or the ability to see the little details in here we've normalized it from zero to one again the units are not particularly fundamental in this case if we look at the diagram we will see that the greatest visual acuity is of course occurring in the fovea meaning when you look straight ahead into something so you know in an automobile no surprise that the speedometer the fuel gauge the rpm counter everything is straight in front of the driver if you put it in the middle of the dashboard like the mini you'll have to make it really big because there isn't much visual acuity over there the visual acuity is over here not over there so uh, visual acuity is very important human factors experts have to always try to make sure that the most critical items of information are lined up with the most likely position of the person's head and their eyes as we've said previously as you move away from the optic axis that gets less and as we've said previously look there's a blind spot so if i put the little emergency indicator right there in a person's blind spot and then the thing lights up and the guy doesn't stop maybe it was the oil pressure uh, indicator telling you you've lost oil pressure and if you don't stop the engine you're going to blow it up if the guy keeps going and blows up the engine who's at fault the driver who didn't turn the engine off when he lost the oil pressure or the designer put the oil pressure uh, uh, the oil pressure uh, light emergency light right in the person's blind spot which quite often the person would then not notice visual acuity uh, one other important thing which designers usually keep in mind visual acuity is depending on the intensity of the light itself if i take something and i want to read something and i'm looking at it the more light i have and you will know this from practical experience nothing surprising here the more light you have the easier it's going to be to read it the better is going to be your ability to resolve or understand fine details and the more the more the, the wider clearer better understanding you're going to get of the colors particularly the subtle variations in color in the image so if you want to read a magazine a fashion magazine with lots of really enjoyable color images very important use of color you'd want to have a lot of light on it this diagram is a scientific diagram showing that fact which is on the x-axis we have the illumination level again with a light meter like the one you use with your camera how much illumination are we putting on the thing and again we've normalized it put zero in the middle it's not a big issue just look at the shape of the diagram the amount of light down the x-axis the person's ability to see fine details in the pictures along the y and an s-shaped curve which looks like part of the Gaussian distribution going from I can't see anything at all it's pitch black all the way to wow I see every color in the image and when I add more light it doesn't change anything anymore I'm already seeing everything there is this illumination uh, curve this visual acuity curve is important to consider when you design the lighting systems for offices workplaces the cabins of aircraft the cabins of automobiles when you decide the color usage or the fonts you're going to put into the magazine or on the screen of the laptop where you know how much light intensity is the maximum you can get out of the laptop display all of these things come into play from a design perspective and in terms of design classics I'm going to introduce now one design classic which covers the issues of acuity and uh, accommodation and so forth that we've discussed so far in the vision chapter. And the design classic I'm referring to here 
is the Times New Roman font. Probably many of you have not given much consideration to the fonts you're using on your laptop or the ones that came from the papers and used in magazines. But Times New Roman has a very interesting history. Times New Roman goes back to the early 30s and it came into being because the owner or head editor from the Times newspaper of London was incredibly unhappy about the fact that many of the London-based newspapers were using fonts on their pages, which the gentleman found very hard to read, and he wanted his newspaper to try to come up with a better font that's easier on the eye, easier to read, gets you less eye fatigue, gets you less tired. So they went and looked at it. By 1932, they were putting into practice the for the first time this font, which came to be called the Times New Roman, on the newspaper itself. And in one form or another, this font has been in use ever since. And it's a standard font in most... Uh, uh, graphics packages, most word processors, most softwares today. With minor updates, it hasn't changed dramatically. So what is it that was good about this font that was better than some of the other ones that were being used at the time? Well, a couple of things. If we look at the letters on, uh, on, the, on the slide, on the visual, you can see a couple things. First of all, Times New Roman makes very good use of the height of the letter. Please notice the capitals are of similar heights, but particularly the lowercase letters. We've got a center region, such as what you see with uh, M, N, or O as letters. We've got a center region being used as much as possible. But then we've got a drop down below the line, as in P and Q, and we've got a drop up or a razor, uh, as in K, H, L, F. So we're using the height to facilitate the, the ability of the line, uh, or the ability of the eye to scan the line. So we're using height to distinguish different letters to make the job easier for the brain to pick it up quickly without confusing one letter for another. Height is being used as a distinguishing characteristic. Another thing which is very strong in uh, Times New Roman is uh, the use of the serif, S-E-R-I-F. For those of you who are not too familiar with that, it's the little straight line at the bottom of letters. For example, looking at lowercase p or q, you can see that the dropper doesn't just drop and stop, but there's a little sort of line segment cutting across at the very bottom of the P and the very bottom of the Q. Now, what is that doing? To facilitate reading across long lines of text, particularly in the sort of broadsheet newspapers that were in use in the 1930s, you might be reading 20 or 30 words before you get to the end of the line and come back to the next. So there's a lot of following the line. Now, in medieval manuscripts, in some ancient Roman writings, you'll actually see lines across, and a person's putting the letters on the lines such that the eye can follow the line to not drop below or, or pop up onto the next and then get all mixed up because you're mixing the words from different lines of the writing. So putting serif, even though it's not on every letter on the, in each case, but most letters will have a serif somewhere, it's sort of like giving you a set of virtual lines, not complete, not straight lines across, but pieces of lines that the eye follows, and it helps you to stay and read on the same line until that line's finished and you pass to the one below it. So the serif makes Times New Roman a little bit easier to follow and creates a little bit less eye fatigue. And then on, on top of that, another important factor was the spacing between the letters. If you've ever seen something like the Gutenberg Bible, you will be familiar with the case that for a long time, letters were always spaced. They were built on blocks 
and the blocks always had the same space one to the other. Here the spacing between the letters is varying slightly depending on the shape of the letter such that the middle section of the letter is roughly the same distance but maybe the top or the bottom might be a little bit closer or further. So we're trying to keep a sort of distance in the middle of the letter even if it means bringing the top or the bottom of successive letters slightly closer or slightly further apart. And then there's a couple other smaller details and I would invite you to pick up a book on Times New Roman, look it up on the internet. There's several other smaller details about the actual shapes of some of the letters which makes them easier to identify, more rapid to identify and um, less fatiguing to read. So Times New Roman an excellent example of using visual acuity, also for the lines and the serifs. You couldn't get away with those serifs without the level of visual acuity we had, uh, and illumination, other things can be brought into play. Moving on, if everything up to now was very much about the optical properties of the rods and cones, of the lens and cornea, of the accommodation process. If we were talking in terms of intensities and acuities, we were talking about adjusting to get the best out of the system. We really didn't say very much so far about the subjective experience itself of vision. And perhaps the most dramatic part of the subjective expression itself is color. And color is a whole topic which is quite often the subject of books and talks and fields of endeavor and research all to its own because it's got its own fascinating complexities and its own fascinating scientific background. So let's start and talk a little bit about color. It's used very extensively by designers, including human-centered designers, and it's fundamental to understand some of the properties of the human color vision. Now, first of all, color is a subjective sensation. This is not scientific property. So everything we're gonna be talking about in the next few minutes is not something like two plus two equals four that can be scientifically demonstrated. We still don't know for sure how the kinds of electric signals which travel around the brain from the eyes, to the visual cortex, to the frontal cortex. We still don't know exactly how that comes to be what we see in terms of red, blue, green, yellow, white, black, and so forth. Uh, the subjective sensation, like consciousness itself, is still somewhat of a mystery to science. Science has measured lots of things, but science has not fully explained how we can think or we should think about this. So we have to be practical and try to understand what we can do about it and what, cert what effects certain things has, even though we don't really know for sure what is causing it or, or how best to think about it. So first thing to mention, as a subjective sensation, two things which look to be to us exactly the same color it's quite likely that if we put their paint under some sort of scientific analysis, a chromatograph or some other device, we will find that they're not exactly the same. The physical properties of things which can look the same to us in terms of color quite often are vastly different. Different mixtures of different things can produce the same subjective sensation in my mind. This is a one starting point we have to consider for color. Next consideration. Already for at least a thousand years, probably more, we've known that color is trichromatic. It's what referred to as trichromatic. What does that mean? It means people who were painting things, people who were coloring things, people who were playing or philosoph philosophizing, philosophers considering the nature of the subjective sensation of color. For thousands of years, we've known that we can take three 
colors, three pigments, three types of dirt, three types of sand, three types of grass or, or plant material, and we can mix them together and we can get a color. And then we can maybe get three different ones, and if we find the right percentages and the right way of mixing it, we might get exactly the same color again. So somehow, even though we didn't know what was going on inside the eye, and we didn't know why, we didn't know any of the neuroscience behind it, people have known that color could be described by three properties or three base ingredients or three pigments or whatever the practical situation was involving three of something, whatever it was, could be used to create a targeted color. We've known that for a long time. More recently, scientific progress, medical progress, and so forth has permitted us to understand where this is coming from. And what was found was the eye has rods, the eye has cones. The rods only pick up intensities and give you differences. The cones are the ones which somehow are producing the subjective sensation of color. And the cones, there's more than one type. And lo and behold, after thousands of years of mixing three different pigments to get a paint to put on a canvas, we found there were three types of cones. One type of cone responds to the frequencies from four to 500 nanometers in wavelength, and that's on the left of the left-hand diagram. The other cone picks up the middle frequencies, typically 450 to six or 650, and the last of the three picks up the higher frequency, shifting slightly more towards 700 nanometers. So what is going on here? We have three different types of cones. Each one has slightly different chemicals, slightly different balances of chemicals and pigments inside, and it makes them sensitive to photons of light that have different frequencies. So when you look at them, they're rather similar from the outside, but inside there's a, a machinery of chemicals which is slightly more sensitive to one set of frequencies or to the other or to the other. So we have three types of cones. And the three types of cones which are on the diagram on the left, then in man-made, people-made, human-made systems, artificial systems like a computer screen, a projector, uh, the television, the camera with its film, it gets typically uh, into three equal distant definitions. So engineers will come along and say, okay, we need three if we're gonna behave like the eye and create colors in a way that's natural to the eye. Being uh, engineers and scientists, we try to do it very efficiently. We space them out equally, like what's shown on the diagram on the right. But what you've got on the right is how we mimic or recreate or model for purposes of making our machines what's happening inside the eye. And there is your red, your green, and your blue. So every time you open up your settings and you adjust your cell phone or you adjust your uh, laptop and you can get the percentages of R and G and B, red, green, blue, that's what you're doing. You're adjusting a set of frequencies that are being reproduced on the screen and they're stimulated, they're emulating, they're copying, they've been inspired by the three types of cones that we find in the human eye. So color response to the human eye is all about the cones, three different types, far from an equal spacing or perfect spacing over millions of years evolution has gotten us this far but in our artificial systems, we simplify a bit and do it more like what's on the right. And when we talk about color, it's very important as designers, particularly, that we're being very clear about how we're thinking about the color, which model we're using. There is the way of thinking about it, which is about making the color, pushing out electromagnetic radiation from a screen of an electrical device, and that's the RGB model, which is what's referred to as additive. 
I'm going to add some of the frequency, this one, and I'm going to add a little bit of that one, and a little bit of the third one, and the three sets of frequencies will make people see yellow, purple, blue, whatever. There's the other way of looking at it, which is the more traditional way, which is what's involved not in electronic screens, but magazines, uh, posters, paintings, uh, colors on the buildings and interior decorating and so forth and so on, which is what's referred to as the subtractive model of color. I can take some material, some pigments, some sand, some dirt, some some pigments taken from Mother Nature, from the beach, from the mountain, from the mine, wherever it is, things that have colors to it that I can see, I can mix them together with some glue and some other things to make a paint, and when I put that paint on a canvas or on a wall, the paint absorbs all the frequencies coming from the sun, except some of them that bounce off, the ones that are allowed to bounce off, the others are captured like a sponge by the paint, the ones that bounce off are the ones I see. So when I see red, it's because the paint has absorbed all the other frequencies except red. And when I see yellow, it's absorbed all the other, it's only let me see as bouncing off of it, the yellow. So that's what's referred to as subtractive. So if we're making electromagnetic radiation as with a computer or cell phone screen, we're talking usually about an RGB model and there's standards and design guides for that and electrical standards for the engineering aspects. If we're talking about mixing paints and pigments and colors and painting walls and floors and canvases, dyeing, putting dye on a carpet or on cloth for your clothes, well, that's the subtractive model. And the additive model is RGB, red, green, blue model, that's the usual terminology. And the subtractive is CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is key, K-E-Y. And we'll look at that in a second, what key is, why we get this key, where this came from. Okay, starting with the RGB model, which is very important these days with electrical devices. Already in the 1930s, the Commission Internationale de Flair, they defined a international standard, a group of experts in optics, vision, science, electromagnetic radiation people from around the world got together and said, look, for the last 50, 100 years, different manufacturers of cameras, people like Kodak, people who today uh, go by the name of Agfa, or Fuji or whatever. Companies around the world in the industrialized countries were making films, chemical films for cameras, and everybody made their own, and there was no comparison between them. The colors you get from the Kodak film in North America might be slightly different from the colors you'd get from an Agfa in Germany or Holland. So. There were a lot of questions and issues about how can we standardize things at least a little bit for use by industry so people can test things and, and say something about how theirs compares to someone else's. So the 1930s uh, group of people got together and they came up with the RGB definition, red, green, blue being the three base colors which are not too distant from the actual centers of the frequencies for the cones of the eyes. And they said, let's come up with a scale based on that, and let's use that as a universal language for comparison. In the RGB system, we're talking about percentages. Each of the three colors, you can mix in a percent of that amount of frequency into the electronics and project out uh, a certain range of color you talk about having, let's say, 33% red, 33% green, 33 something percent blue, they have to add up to one in total. So the idea is, you know, if two colors are defined, this much red, this much green as color percentages, you know it all has to add up to 100% or 1, so you can go and figure out how much is the missing part. And depending on the percentages, you get the range of colors which exist in nature. 
you can see here that, for example, if I have 20% of red and I have maybe 10, 20% perhaps of green and the rest is blue, if I put those together, I get purple. You know, whereas if I have 20% of the red and 60% of the green, I'm very much a shade of green. So the various colors that occur in nature can all be accounted for by looking at the percentages of the RGB. It's important also to consider that this particular system, the CIE system, when they refer to one or a hundred percent, red, 100% green, 100% blue, they're referring to something theoretical. There is no such thing in nature as a hundred, a blue that's so deep and so perfect that it, it would meet the criteria of the CIE 100% value. But what they did was they said, if you can imagine a perfect one, and that was 100%, all the real ones, all the real shades of color in nature can be found and accommodated by percentages on the scales where the theoretical, not really true, end of the scale was 100%. Now the CMYK, the cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, this is what we're seeing in most printers, particularly large-scale industrial printers that we use today. Printers, because we're printing an ink onto a sheet of paper, the light from the sun or the lights inside a room bounces off the paper and then comes what's left to your eye and the ink, whatever it absorbs of the frequencies of the light, it leaves only a little and what it leaves is what you see. So this is the subtractive Root. This is taking frequencies out of the light, and, and what's left is what you get. CMYK is the system. The K is um, the K is what's referred to as key, and you can see in the image above, at the top of the slide, you have a cartridge with cyan, the yellow, and the magenta. And then in this industrial printer, you see two additional cartridges, one small, one large, with pure black ink. Now, the larger one, usually in most uh, printers, will be the black cartridge for when you're printing black and white images, uh, text, letters, and so forth, where you're not using color. Since people do a lot of printing of that sort, there's usually a, a container and a cartridge dedicated to that. But what's interesting here is what's referred to as key, which is the other smaller black cartridge on the left of the picture. What key is, it's a black foundation that gets printed and then the colors get put on top. So if I want to print a high quality picture of the kind that you see in fashion magazines, photography books and other things where the, the colors and the details of the images are very sharp and very engaging, they've always been printed with at least one layer, sometimes two or three, of black underneath. In the same manner that if you put silver black on the back of a sheet of glass, you get a mirror and it reflects the light back through. It reflects it much better than without it. Here, if you put the black underneath and put the colors on top, you get a deeper, clearer, uh, better detailed image with the colors on top. So key is the recognition of the fact that to get deep, well-saturated, highly detailed, engaging images, it's best to put some foundation or layers of black underneath and then print the colors on top of that to get somewhat of a mirror effect going on the page. So the CMYK is the recognition of we print the three colors, but when you want the colors to be vibrant, you'll be using the key and you may be using the key quite a bit. So the key is an extra cartridge of black ink. Now CMYK because it's based not on theories and scientific values of radiation frequencies or wavelengths, CMYK is a much more practical down-to-earth thing, because literally we're talking about pigments, 
from the earth, which are put in the inks or put in the paints. Because of that, there's a wide variety of standards for describing them. CMYK printing, different manufacturers of different printing systems might refer their system and then you have to refer your file when you pass them something in Illustrator or some other uh, publishing software. You'll have to refer to which standard you're using and there's different ones. ISO, the International Standards Organization, they have a standard. Idea Alliance, some manufacturers are working to that. Great call. Swap probably more last couple of years has probably been some further developments with respect to this list. There's a wide uh, range which depends on what kind of pigments and ingredients the manufacturers wish to privilege or wish to use most, and different standards can be more or less efficient for their purposes. So you have to be careful which one it's printing to. Anyone who's ever fired off a photograph from their digital SLR and sent it to a print shop and got back a print where the colors and the, and the detail doesn't look anything like what it looks like on the screen, will realize the importance of asking which standard their print equipment is usually using, loading that standard on your desktop system, seeing what it looks like, and then making any necessary adjustments to get it the way you wish it to be. So very important with uh, printing or painting that we be very careful how we're specifying it. And then in terms of color properties, there are some generic, uh, somewhat more scientific uh, terms and semantics which are in use. They're sort of neutral ways of expressing certain concepts. And the main ones you'll see on various software systems and packages are terms such as U, which is referring to the color, saturation, how deep or perfect it is, and the brightness, just how uh, strongly it comes out from the screen or the page. These terms will be used somewhat generically so as to avoid getting into the technicalities of the actual technical system you're using. Now in terms of color, going back to the human factors and ergonomics very closely, it's incredibly important for designers to recognize that a large number of people have difficulties in seeing color. Uh, females, uh, not too big an issue, m much less than 1%. But with males, with the boys, uh, as much as 8 or 9% in most countries and cultures of the male members of the population will have some degree of color blindness or at least let's call it color deficiency. So it's very important as designers to consider that a large number of people will have difficulty separating colors and what happens when the person controlling something doesn't see the difference between the green colored warning which says it's okay and the red colored warning which says there's a problem. These are the kinds of issues that come up and inclusive design and accessible design the systems for translating your interface into a different one with different colors such that people with col various types of color blindness are not too penalizing and still make out the differences clearly. Now the main, uh, the most common, the most frequently discussed and utilized color uh, defect uh, system is the one that's shown here on the scale which is the Ishihara color blindness test. Uh, if you have an iPhone or an Android machine, you just have to go to the iStore and you'll find probably six or eight different implementations of Ishihara tests because they're fun, they're engaging, you learn things when you try it out. There are different tests that as is shown here, there's many little dots in different colors and depending on how well your three cones are operating, you either see a number or a letter or something in the, in the circle, or you don't. And here you can see an example. A person with normal vision would see what we're seeing on the left of this slide. You see a 6 or a 74 amongst the colored dots. If you have one of the cones not working perfectly. And it might just be, you know, it doesn't have to be completely not working, just 
it's not working at 100% efficiency, or you have two, or you have three, these are the kinds of things you'd be seeing if one of your cones doesn't work, two don't work, or all three are now giving you grayscale, black and white. It's only the rods operating because they're not fully functional. So we can take a look at various defects of color vision with Ishihara tests, and as it says here, as much as 8% of the boys in most countries will have some degree of color blindness, which puts a lot of pressure on designers to think carefully about the colors they assign to things in instructions, in display systems, warnings, particularly things related to emergency situations. And color for designers is a very, very powerful tool. And there's different ways a designer can think about color. From a human factors point of view, the science of it, we've covered much of it, but now we're getting even slightly beyond that and thinking about what designers can do with color. And there's several different ways that a person can think about it. One way, very obvious way. What would be the typical subjective response of most people to this color? One thing that's emerged over the last few hundred years from scientific, medical, and other research is that to some degree, we are hardwired neurologically to colors, and we're hard hardwired in connecting to some degree, it's not perfect, but to some degree, we're hardwired in our reactions to different colors, meaning over hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps millions of years of evolution, if we've always been in an environment of a certain color and we've always felt a certain way or had a certain problem or whatever, we've probably adapted to recognizing that automatically to some degree. So what we have here are some examples. Colors such as reds, oranges, yellows, they're considered psychologically and subjectively warm and stimulating. A bright sunny day for most people stimulates certain feelings of happiness and so forth. Not too many people see a nice bright sunny day and, and feel really bad about it. Violets, blues and greens usually create sensations of calm, trust, restfulness and so forth. No surprising that IBM and a whole set of multinational companies use blue as their color for their logos, for many documents, in buildings they might use it for the carpets, the furniture and so forth, because blue tends to create instinctively to some degree, it's not a mathematical on or off, it's to some degree, it'll create sensations of calm. So if you're going to have lots of business meetings and people are going to be having arguments and different points of view are going to lead to conflicts, let's put a blue carpet and blue chairs and that may help a little bit to keep some of the excesses from occurring. And then weak colors are usually considered to be more distant. This one that's at the bottom, which is again physiological, psychological, subjective, this is an old trick of interior designers. If I'm very close to a color, if I'm very close to something and I see a color, from close up, it's going to be very bright. If that same thing is taken further and further away, because there's air in between, and air with its oxygen and nitrogen and other gases, air absorbs energy. The frequencies of oscillation of light or sound or other forms of energy which can move through a medium they get absorbed, they get a, there's a bit of friction in air, it slows things down, it eats up some of the electricity, it eats up some of the energy. So as I move away, the light intensity I'm seeing will go down. It'll go down because being further away, there's a geometric factor, the distance is just longer, and the medium over the longer distance is eating up some of the energy. There's a bit of friction. It's, it's taking some out of the environment. So if I see something very, very bright, 
because this is the physics of the world I live in, I'm born and raised in that, I'm probably the result of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution in that environment, my brain, when it sees a really bright yellow, red, green, orange, purple, whatever, my brain thinks it's very close to it. And when I see one that's sort of pastel, sort of faded, not completely bright and shiny and not very saturated, when I see a color like that, my brain thinks it's further away. So, if I have a small kitchen, if I have a small bedroom, if I have a small living room in my house and I use pastel colors for the wall, colors that my brain will naturally tend to associate with being far away, I can make the room seem a bit bigger. And this is a classic trick of interior design. Never use really bright, saturated colors on a tiny, tiny little space, unless there's more to it than just that. Unless you've got some furniture or something else that's gonna create some sort of specific effect. If you want to give a feeling of spaciousness and roominess, pastel colors will usually help quite a bit towards that, because that, again, to some degree, is a hardwired, natural, psychological, subjective response. Other ways of thinking about colors, the color wheel is another way of thinking about colors. Uh, there's been several studies over the years, such as this one, where they've gone to different countries, where there's different cultures of people, often speaking different languages, and they've taken certain words, like here on the list you see anger, art, authority, beauty, calm, cold, compression, courage, and they take words, and they asked people to choose from a big selection of colors. They had a great big tray with dozens, possibly hundreds of colors. And they asked people to select the color that they think fits best the word in that culture, in that country, in that place, at that moment in time. And lo and behold, people in different countries will associate colors with different words, meaning different values. Uh, it's, you know, we know a lot about differences, for example, between Western and Eastern preferences in relation to colors such as red and green. They often have very different meanings in Western Europe or in Eastern Asia. So uh, colors, we can think of them not so much in the physiological terms as in the previous example, but we can think of them as culturally, contextually grounded. They don't mean anything maybe on their own, but in a place, at a point in time, for some people, it might have a meaning. Things like color wheels, there's several available, and they're usually this kind of a system, and you can choose the color as a designer based on what you're trying to say and get across. You know, people do, these are mistakes people make all the time. They say something, our company offers this for this reason, and you should like it for this reason. But then the color scheme is actually, in that culture, the opposite. And even though the average person may not notice immediately this difference, because they may not be familiar with color theory, somehow in the back of your mind, something doesn't feel right. And these kinds of errors happen all the time in design. So you can think of color as contextually grounded or contextually created by a group of people, a group of people in a point in time, and you can use that as a reference. What was it I was trying to design? What was it I was trying to say with this? Which color should I adopt? Another way to look at colors is more time dependent, more temporal or historical. There are uh, catalogs of color uh, theories, uh, such as the one called Colorscape, which is illustrated here, just a couple pages from the book. Here, they talk about color for use in architecture, interior design, fashion, and so forth, as a temporal or historical construction. So here, we can talk about what was the color people were using to paint their house at a certain point in time? What was the color people were using in manuscripts and books at a certain point? What color clothing? the people wear in a certain city or a certain part of the world at a certain point in time. So Colorscape provides a catalog where a for, a organized index by different countries or different regions, 
you can go look up different colors and what you get is what you see in this image. You had the names such as Chianti, Sorrento, Milanese, Sistine, Medici, for this is a page from Italy. You can pick up different colors. You'll have the full color specification in CMYK system in case you want to print something in that color mix a paint in that color and so forth. So when you need to produce the paint is the CMYK dis uh, description and then there's a little explanation about where the name comes from, what the color represents and what's its historical significance. So if you're launching some product and saying this is the coffee that everybody drinks in Milan, you might want to choose perhaps Milanese Blue as part of the packaging or part of the uh, part of the design of whatever it is you're designing for that coffee system. And if you do that, again, the average person may not immediately notice the connection because not everyone is dedicating their life to color theory. However, in the back of people's minds, correlations and connections between nervous centers will occur because people will have seen this color in that place when they look at the city, when they go to museums, when they read books, and that will be in the back of their mind. They may never notice it, but something will occur when you make that connection. And then another example of use of color is what's very popular at the moment, the, the growth of the internet and online sales, the, the Amazons of this world and so forth has led to an enormous amount of research about the effect of color selection on human purchasing decisions and on human decisions more generally. Uh, one, com uh, one company called Kissmetrics has uh, published a lot of guidelines and a lot of information about how things change and Kissmetrics data comes from very simple tests. We make uh, an internet website we set up the entry page in the portal with certain buttons and certain menus and we make several versions of it with different colors for the buttons or the text or the fonts or we change the pictures, their color backgrounds, you know, there's lots of graphical uh, design choices which can be varied and we'll run the interface for several weeks with one setup and then it'll automatically switch into a second setup and a third and a fourth in which we're mixing and changing all these different parameters and then at the end of the month or the end of the year we can see how the sales figures and the clicks and the selections of the users we can look at things like time on target and other things that people use when they're doing interaction design and we can see if color made any different when I made the the buy button yellow or I made it red, or I made it blue, or green, or brown, or black, did it make any difference? And the answer is usually yes, big difference, very dramatic differences. And here are some of the uh, observations and some of the guidelines that uh, Kissmetrics has published over the years. And as designers, these are things we have to take into consideration. It's very important to realize that just saying something offering some functionality or providing something on its own is only one part of the issue. There's a lot more needed to engage with people, make it enjoyable, make it interesting, and reach to their subconscious for these decisions. Now, design classics for the use of color specifically, as opposed to acuity and the other things that we talked about with Times New Roman, for the use of color, I'm just going to show a couple of examples. The first one is Rosso Ferrari. Ferrari, uh, as a company, is identified almost completely with this color. And Ferrari's branding, public publicizing, all, just about everything that's done, Formula One racing and so forth, utilizes this color. Uh, those of you who enjoy automobiles, particularly automobile racing, may be familiar with the fact that when automobile racing first started in the early 1900s, we had a situation where these first cars that were racing, sometimes they might be very far 
from where the bandstands were, where the people were. And in Europe, they adopted a system of colors to help people to separate which was the car that came from France and which was the car from Germany or Italy or Spain or England or whatever. And the set of colors that were agreed by international committee were France was blue, Italy was red, uh, United Kingdom as, the we, as we know it today was uh, racing green, British racing green, Germany was gray or, or silver, and so forth and so on. Um, these colors were used for quite a few years in the 1920s, 1930s, right up probably to the Second War. And they were used to make it easier to see for the average spectator who probably at that time didn't have binoculars and it wasn't being watched on TV, there was no TV, so it was just to make it easier to see for the average person. Now after the Second War, Ferrari decided to stick with the color, even though the system was abandoned and they felt particularly with the birth of television it wasn't that important anymore, Ferrari decided to stick with it. And then over 20, 30, 40 years of racing success, that red took on a set of meanings. It meant success, it meant Formula One, it meant Ferrari as a company and so forth. So eventually, this became part of the brand. So Rosso Ferrari is a branded, patented or trademarked at least, uh, property. If you want to use this paint color, this exact one, exactly this one, in any kind of product or in any kind of situation, you have to pay royalties to the Ferrari company. Even within the same company, when it was part of the same company as Alfa Romeo, if Alfa Romeo wanted to use this red rather than Rosso Alfa, they would have had to pay Ferrari a royalty. So this is an example of where red, uh, where a color, let's say, can take on importance and meaning in a design context which goes well beyond the natural subjective reaction a person would have had and possibly even beyond the cultural or somewhat historical reaction. This is a case of a business who repeatedly used the colors and was repeatedly successful with it and created a new meaning and a brand development around it. So color as a design parameter from a human perspective can be incredibly powerful if its use is systematic, if its use is planned, and if its use is consistent. Another way of uh, uh, using color, which is very different from the Ferrari example, is the sissy lamp. The sissy lamp by uh, Philip Stark. Here was a situation where the designer was approached and asked to come up with a low-cost, low-budget solution which would permit the company to offer a wide, the widest possible range of lamps for people for their homes. The idea was, unlike Ferrari, who's saying, if you're one of us and you think like us and you like our values, adopt this color, refer to this color. Here the idea was we're going to turn the spotlight around completely 180 degrees and we're going to look at our customers, the people involved, and we're going to say everyone has their own home, everyone has their own preferences, their own tastes, their own interests, and we would like to offer a tool to personalization, not a brand development focus, but a tool for everyone to develop their own tastes and their own interests. So what Philip Stark uh, specified was a lamp which in terms of its metaphor, its iconography, its semiotics, it looks just like a classic simple European desk lamp perhaps from the previous century, but it's made in a low cost injection molded plastic who, which can be mixed into any one of the colors you want and the initial color palette had at least 30 or 50 different colors in it and this would permit a person to go to the shop or go online purchase a lamp where they're all the same and they're very cheap they only cost a small number of pounds but they can purchase the lamp whose color is closest possible to what their room actually looks like. So if you have a living room with a red sofa, 
you can buy a red lamp. If you have a bedroom in which you develop lots of artwork on the walls and they're yellow and blue, you can pick a yellow or a blue lamp and so forth and so on. So here we see color being used not as a focal point for a systematic effort to say something and to express something and to do something, we're, we're seeing it as flipped around and say, if we can offer the widest possible range at a low cost, and the design of the lamp and the materials are part of the formula, we can permit people to personalize, express themselves, and be their own designer. So this is flipping color usage the other way around. And then finally, as the final example of a design classic, those of you who are Ettore Sotsas uh, fans will be familiar with the Memphis movement in uh, furniture design, interior design. Uh, Memphis was a movement that said not all furniture and not all things in homes or offices need to be based only on functionality. Life's too short to just be functional, so we can be aesthetically pleasing as well. And part of the message here was to not just choose geometric shapes where the aesthetics have a precedence in many cases over the functionality, such as this totemic bookshelf called the Carlton, but to use the colors as shockingly as possible, as color contrasting as possible in terms of the color wheel to drive the message home. So whereas the Ferrari is a single color, which is a rally point for a whole set of values, and the Sissi was a multiple set of colors for personalization and self-expression, the Memphis movement is using color and geometry together to break the mold, break the pattern, to shock, and to send messages about non-conformity and individualism. So color can be used in many ways, as a way to group, as a way to permit individualism, or as a way to make statements, perhaps shockingly so. Uh, color is a strong design parameter for all of these possibilities. And with that, uh, that, we come to an end to today's discussion. I hope that in the materials about vision, that there were some things that were useful to you. As I said at the beginning of today's talk, 70 to 80% of the information we tend to use most of the time to do things or to think things or to make decisions is visual. A large part of what's inside our head is visual cortex. So it's very important to designers, particularly of the human factors, ergonomics type, to be familiar with some of the concepts from today's talk. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'll be speaking with you again next time.